I'm sorry for the big title. I've been told that it was vague. Um, so I'm currently in UCSD uh, doing a postdoc, but what I'm presenting today is uh, from a previous postdoc in NLE. So it's a work that I've done with uh, Lei Fristrop, Jun uh, Zhang, and on the theory side with Anna Oza and uh, Fang Fang and Mike Shai. So what we're looking at is how um, microscopic swimmer interacts with the flow and how couple motion can come out of that. So, okay, so when you have a body that moves within the flow, it's perturbing the flow, and so that is going to affect the behavior of other swimmers that are nearby. And so it, it's been shown that uh, such fluid-mediated interaction can promote ordering and alignment in the flow. And so this is a striking example here uh, from the Bartolo group, where they have so they have a bunch of particles that move uh, randomly inside a, uh, an arena. And at some point, the whole group self-organized, and they start all moving in the same direction. So Active Matter has been a pioneer in such uh, system of many-body thing. And they've been looking at system in the low Reynolds number regime. But uh, much less is known uh, in the higher Reynolds number regime. And the reason is that we have to deal with uh, complex and steady flows. And also, we don't really know how the flows are going to affect the dynamics of the swimmers. And yet it's something that is uh, very relevant to a lot of systems. For example, so you have those uh, animal formation with birds, flux here, or um, uh, fish school here. And we don't really know what is the role of hydrodynamics uh, in those assemblies. So the um, most natural way to deal with uh, many body problems is to solve with a simple case of two bodies. So here, I'm showing you uh, studies, so two studies. So in high Reynolds number flow, an uh, idealized uh, system of swimmer is a flapping wing, which kind of mimic the wing of a bird or the movement of a fish. So here you have two swimmers that are uh, fixed at a prescribed distance in an incoming flow. And what they saw is, uh, depending on the timing of arrival of the vortices on that second wing, you're going to have destructive or constructive interference, and so you're going to have an enhanced or decreased uh, thirst. So now what happens if you, the wing are not fixed anymore and you let them move? So what happens is uh, what that simulation is showing here. At some point, the, so if you look at the distance between the two wings, at some point they aggregate and they stay in those configurations that corresponds to coherent interaction with the flow. So um, starting from those results, we wanted to look at uh, what is going to be the behavior of the smaller school. So what's going to happen when you have two swimmers that can move uh, in the flow? Are they going to interact? So this is the experiment uh, I'm showing you. A video, it's going to be better. Okay, so this is the experiment. So we have our two swimmers are two wing. They each mounted on a different branch, and the branch is connected to a central shaft through which, uh, through which we apply the up and down motion. So we have two ball bearings that allows the wing to move entirely freely uh, in the horizontal plane, and they can move independently from each other. So what you have to take out of it is we prescribe the vertical motion, but the horizontal motion is entirely an outcome of the interaction of the wing with the, with the flow. So everything that you see, every couple of motion, is a signature of uh, hydrodynamic interaction. So we can look at uh, the emergent behavior. Oh, I'm sorry. Typically, we look at the uh, distance in between the wing and the speed of the, of the swimmers. So we could expect different things. We could expect them to be attracted, to repel, or just move unaffected by the other one. And actually, so what we saw is kind of very interesting. What you see is that the swimmer are going to aggregate into certain configurations. So they lock together, and they're going to stay and maintain that distance over a like, long period of time. And those are very stable and very robust things, meaning that if you perturb a little bit, the following guy is going to oscillate back to equilibrium. And also what you see here is that for the same driving motion, you have multiple stable configuration. So the idea next was, uh, how do we understand that? And to do that, we changed the driving motion, so namely the frequency of the beating and the amplitude. So that's what I'm uh, showing here for uh, the case of 4 hertz. So we start with a lower amplitude of beating, and we identify three stable configurations. So the color here refers to the three configurations. Blue is the smallest spacing, green is the second one, and orange is the third one. So you can also measure the speed, and you can see that in all three configurations, the tandem pretty much uh, swim at the same uh, speed. So when you increase the amplitude of the oscillation, 
So you still find those three stable configurations, but they're uh, further apart. So you see that the spacing gradually increased the wing stage further. And if you look at the speed, so you flap with a high amplitude, it goes faster. And every configuration also goes pretty much at similar speed. So you do that, so this is for a single frequency. You can do the exact same thing for other frequencies, so namely uh, 3 and 2 hertz. So for the, if you look at the spacing, you get the similar behavior. As you increase the amplitude, they sit further apart, except that when you are at lower uh, frequency, the spacing is reduced. So now if you look at the speed, so what you see is across all kinematics, you go faster as you flap faster or you flap with a high amplitude. But what is interesting is, is if you look at a single kinematic here, you can see that the tandem goes slightly uh, faster than a single wing would. So the single wing I'm showing here in black, and actually that speed enhancement show better in that inset that shows the comparison of the speed. And you can see that you can have an enhancement up to 25% especially when the wings are close together. So this is as a function of the spacing here. So not only does the leader affect the follower, but also the follower drive the leader to swim faster than it would in isolation. And so that effect extends over several body lengths, so it's kind of a long range effect. So the question now is, how do we understand that graph? How do we understand what sets the stable position? And when you think of it, when you change the frequency and amplitude of your forcing, basically you're changing the trajectory that it's doing. So the trajectory is a combination of the up and down motion and the forward motion. And so a natural thing to compare the, those distance with is the wavelength of that uh, motion that it's doing. So that's what we did. Uh, we defined the schooling number, which is the gap in between the two wings over uh, the wavelength of the motion. So basically it's looking at distances in terms of how many wavelengths can you fit in there. And so we replotted all those previous data in terms of that schooling number. And what you see is you have a pretty good collapse of the data. So every time you're at a stable position, it's an integral number of the schooling number. Meaning that first stable position, you're one wavelength away. Second, you're two wavelength away, and so on. So to understand uh, what's going on, then we say, oh, let's look at the flow. Let's look at wait, what's going on. So we seeded the flow uh, with bees, and we shine a laser sheet that intersects the wing path, and we can look at the flow and what it looks like. So here is a movie of a single wing. OK, so if you look at a single wing, so the wing is typically leaving uh, inverse von Karman uh, flow. So this is an alternation of counter uh, rotating forces. So this is a signature of a body that is uh, producing thrust. So that's for a single wing. And now uh, let's look at what it looked like when you have two of them. Okay, so this is the pair in its first uh, stable state. So the leader is leaving the same chain of voices. And when you look at the follower in the first stable position, what it does is that the nose of the wing is going through each core of the voices, and also it's going up in the upflow, down in the downflow. And consistently across uh, all kinematics, the first stable state is always going to correspond to that thing. So when we looked at that, then uh, guided by those flow uh, visualization, we decided to um, try to derive a mathematical model to see if we can retrieve those stable position from how the wing is interacting with the flow structure that we just saw. So I'm not uh, going to get into details. This is the work of Anand and Fang Fang. Um, but what we saw is that with the model, two model that we have, we can predict the existence of stable state and we can predict the same uh, stable state that we saw. So the interesting part here is it doesn't seem to depend on the way you model the flow. You can have like point vortices or you can have like a chain of voices, a continuous uh, thing, and it also doesn't depend on the geometry of the wing that you choose. So we have something here that is very generic, um, yeah, a very generic phenomenon. So the last step is uh, we wanted to measure what are the forces that maintain the cohesion of the wing. Because if you perturb a bit, the wing is going to come back to equilibrium, which means that there's for hydrodynamic forces that restore the equilibrium. So to do that, uh, I intentionally apply uh, external force. So, for example, here on the picture, I'm pushing the follower closer to the leader. And then, uh, so it's going to force the follower to relocate to a new position where that external load is going to be balanced out by a net hydrodynamic force. So I look at the position, and then I, I know that at that position, the force, the hydrodynamic forces, is going to be what I apply in the first uh, place. 
So if I increase the external load, I can map out um, the force profile around each state. So I'm not going to get into detail, but basically I'm not applying a force directly on the wing. I'm using the fact that it's connected to the central axis, and so I apply a torque on that so that it doesn't perturb the flow. So first thing is, if you look at uh, what the speed of the wing is, it's not much affected by the fact that I'm uh, applying a force. So that is going to primarily change the position of the flow. Now if you look at the speed, so let's look at the exploration around the first stable state. If I apply no force, uh, the wing is going to sit at its former equilibrium, so integral number of this, uh, this cooling number. So force is equal to zero because the thrust and the drag balance out is no uh, hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic forces uh, on, the, on the wing. And if you push the follower a little bit away from that state, it's going to encounter an increasing restoring force that's pushing it back uh, to the equilibrium. So locally you have something that kind of looks like a hooking string that maintains uh, your equilibrium. And if you push it a bit more far away, then it's going to jump to the next uh, stable state. And that kind of defines uh, your boundary of the uh, local passing of attraction. So uh, what you see also here is um, non-dimensionalizing by typical uh, fluid load on the, on the wing. And so it's, yeah. it's uh, pretty important for 30% of what you would expect on the wing. And so I did the same thing for the other uh, stable position. And what you get is the same thing, except that the magnitude of force decreased because the influence uh, decreased with distance. So maybe a last thing, easier thing to view it, maybe is a define a potential, so by integration of the data. And you can see that you have a uh, succession of uh, marked well, and that the mark, uh, the well width uh, decrease with the distance. Okay, so conclusion. Uh, so we have the first uh, experimental observation of uh, spontaneous aggregation of swimmers. So we have um, um, configuration with a quantized distance that is w where the elementary uh, distance landscape is the trajectory of the uh, is the wavelength of the trajectory. So we also quantify the extent and the magnitude of the forces, and we show that we could describe the interaction of the two, two swimmers as a uh, following wing that kind of navigate inside the potential that would be generated by the first wing. So the next question, uh, kind of open question, is how does that extend to a lot more swimmers? If you have a group of swimmers, they're going to assume a crystalline arrangement where each swimmer is kind of linked with a, a spring-like forces. And another open question is, how does those results uh, apply to a uh, group of uh, organisms? Or those things uh, kind of like stable, um, dynamic uh, equilibrium of the system? Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, so, in your, in your uh, experiment, you had this, this wing sort of kept horizontal, mm -hmm. sort of kept flat. What do you think would change if you allowed it to have a, um, a turbulent awake? <coughs> maybe take on a different form? I think if you change the motion that you impose to the wing, you kind of change the shape of the, uh, the weight that you leave behind. But, um, so, the, you are... The distance in between two, two wings is always going to be set by kind of like the landscape of the flow structure. So I think it's going to always correspond to the distance in between two vortices, no matter what, no matter what is the motion that you impose to the wing. But maybe that distance is going to change depending on the type of driving you impose. That's my guess. Other questions? Thank you. Um, since this is a, a phase locking effect, um, your width of your potentials that you're finding would probably vary, like Shapiro steps do, where the vessel function as you change the amplitude of your forcing. And there was some slight hint of that on your previous graph, and something you might be able to measure. Um, yeah, there. Wait, you, you can see that your upside down triangles have a slightly wider width, which put there at a lower frequency, I mean, a lower um, forcing amplitude you might be able to actually predict the, the widths of those minima from phase locking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, you can talk about it afterwards. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Sophie. Thank you.